big nonprofit ideas for the other 95%. I'm your aptly named host. This is a special episode of Nonprofit Radio to help you be the change around racism. Starting the racism conversation. The murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police on Memorial Day, May 25th, has incited 14 days of protests and calls for reform of structural racism. Racism and white privilege, after 401 years of it in the United States, exist not only in law enforcement, but all legal structures, education, healthcare, the economy, and nonprofits. What can we, the nonprofit community, do to be the change we want to see? How do we start the racism conversation in our offices? My guest is Kay Suarez, Executive Director, Equity in the Center. It's a real pleasure to welcome Kay Suarez to Nonprofit Radio. She is Executive Director of Equity in the Center, a field-wide initiative to influence social sector leaders to shift mindsets, practices, and systems to achieve race equity. It recently published Awake to Woke to Work, Building a Race Equity Culture. We're going to talk a lot about that which details management and operational levers organizations utilize to transform culture. Your organization is at equityinthecenter.org and at equityinthectr. K is at KLRS98. K Suarez, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you. And uh, we're, uh, we're talking about something that's been going on for, uh, well, 400 years in the United States, but it is now burning in the United States uh, since the, the murder of Mr. Floyd exactly yeah. two weeks ago on, uh, on Memorial Day. Yes. Um, what, um, let's, let's, let's start with a, a, a common understanding. What, what does it feel like to be black in the U.S.? Uh, well, I don't think there's any one way to feel because they're, you know, manifold Black experiences. But I, I think in this moment, um, particularly, it's pain and, and despair around structural racism and the, you know, centuries old devaluing of Black life in this country. Um, so, yeah, I, I'll stop there. I think it's a lot of pain, a lot of despair, but it's not about anything new around structural racism. Certainly the death of George um, Floyd is devastating and there's pain um, and despair around that. But the, the broader structural racism and the way that makes black folks feel on any given day um, and now in the, the wake of George Floyd's murder, that's a common thread of our daily experience. But it's particularly pointed um, and challenging um, to manage on a day-to-day -day basis you know, as a black person in America. And you have a long history in, in nonprofits. Um, yeah. what, what are some of the ways this has manifested for you, you know, in your experience uh, all these years? Um, I think I've been in the nonprofit sector. I guess my first time uh, working in the nonprofit sector was probably back in the year 2000 and so on and off since then. Um, so I, I think in many ways my experience in the nonprofit sector is very similar to my experience working in the for-profit sector. Um, I was generally, unless I was part of an organization that had an affinity focus, meaning it was for black folks or for folks of color, um, the only or one of a few folks of color. I did work in a community-based organization where the CEO um, was a black woman and so the team was, was more diverse. Um, but generally when I've been in nonprofit settings, the power structure mirrors the for-profit sector. Um, and I have been you know, one of very few, even in a space that was explicitly about solving challenges and um, I, don't, I don't wanna say uplifting, I'll say serving uh, black and brown communities. I still was one of the few people of, of color. And I think for me, that resulted in my doing what I do today through Equity in the Center because that tension between the constant narration of self-satisfaction with working in the nonprofit sector and serving black and brown communities and the lack of a 
an honest discussion on race and racism in the sector wasn't tenable for me. But so that's he, why, oh, go ahead. These organizations are serving people of color, but not, re not reflecting the, that community uh, in, in their own staff, in their own structures. Yes, or acknowledging that racism is a, a vital thread that, you know, flows through everything in American life and certainly flows through work that is explicitly about serving black and brown um, communities, because I did work in the education reform sector, which was very much about, quote unquote, closing the achievement gap, which is just institutional racism and structural racism in the education sector, um, overwhelmingly led by very elite white people. Um, and the not even unspoken, but the explicit goal of education reform in the early days, and this has since shifted, was to take elite, mostly white young people and put them in schools that served black and brown children, thinking that that was somehow going to save them. Um, and that savior dynamic is at play in the nonprofit sector in many ways. So I think what I felt is always this tension between a sector that brags about its calling to serve the quote unquote marginalized or disadvantaged and explicitly says in all the spaces that I'm in that their work is about serving quote black and brown communities. So that comes out of one side of the mouth and then out of the other side of the mouth, yeah. there's just silence around race and racism or the explicit refusal to acknowledge that race is significant to the work that you're doing to serve black and brown communities. Um, when the reason they are quote unquote marginalized or falling through the cracks or part of the quote unquote achievement gap, all terms which I have you know, real issues with, um, is because of structural racism, as you're saying, going back hundreds of years. But no one wants to talk honestly about that in my experience in the nonprofit sector. So you're seeing those phrases just as proxies for racism, white, white power, white, um, white power structures? Well, I think they're, yeah, yes, I'd say, you know, short, short answer, yes, but white it's supremacy. a way of talking about the indicators of structural racism, so the quote-unquote achievement gap, um, yeah. or marginalized communities. It's a way of talking about disproportionate outcomes for folks of color um, in a way that generally frames that community as having some sort of an inherent deficit as opposed to framing the challenge around education or the needs around education within the broader system of structural racism in the country. Um, and there's a really you know, direct line that you can draw from structural racism and institutional racism in education and housing and finance and you know, really every aspect of our lives that result in um, disparities by race in society. Um, but that's not the frame that has traditionally been put on these conversations. It's like these are communities that have great need, they're at the margins, you know, how can we come in and really save them and help them as if the, the solutions to the challenges of these communities rested outside of the community, the right, answers rest, yeah. yeah, inside, but often, gen well, generally, really, that's not where the resources are. The, the white savior, um... What, what do you call it? White, white savior. Uh, yeah, complex or, or, or yeah, dynamic. Yeah, yeah because but, the thing that's missing often, the, the assumption is the thing that's missing is white leadership or money or influence or a program. And the challenges that are in any community, the people best positioned to solve those challenges are the folks in those communities. But when you look at black and brown communities, those communities are not resourced. So people come from outside of the community with resources and often in a posture of like having all the answers. And I think as a person of color, I've been a part of a structure of nonprofit and social sector organizations that advance a white savior complex. And I've carried the water for that in a lot of my roles as a, a black yeah. person coming in and representing a white led organization or even an organization that's led by a person of color, but that's upholding white dominant culture in their practice of social sector work, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it does. Um, let's, let's bring it to, um, to uh, equity in the center. What, what's the, the work there? And then of course, we'll get into the, to the, uh, to the research. Sure. So Equity in the Center started as a collaborative that was birthed by a group of grantees of the Annie E. Casey Foundation um, that were funded to 
diversify the so-called talent pipeline in the social sector. So those grantees got together, ProInspire, the organization where, organization where Equity in the Center is currently based, um, AmeriCorps alums, public allies, organizations that had fellowships got together and talked about the absence of diversity at the top. And what they decided they landed on was structural racism as the root cause of that lack of diversity. And that led to the creation of Equity in the Center as this idea for an initiative that would support um, the social sector in, at that time, diversifying the talent pipeline. But as we did our research, we reframed our work to focus on dismantling um, structural racism and building a race equity culture, um, because it's not about the lack of diversity. It's about the lack of a race equity culture um, that will help to mitigate um, inequities and structural racism in the, in the sector. So yeah, we, we did the Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, I want to contrast, you know, diversity with race equity culture. I mean, diversity, I guess, diversity in, in hiring or in who you're serving, you know, that's a data point. Yeah. And it's, it's something to be, to, to aspire to and to achieve, mm -hmm. but it, it, it doesn't, that, that's just, it stops way short of the larger, the, the larger institutionalized and structured problems. Yes, absolutely. And one of the major challenges of, I'm going to say DEI work, because that's what most people call it. We talk yeah. about it as race equity work, but I'm going to say DEI for the reasons that you're saying. So DEI has been become really code for race, but the letters DEI, which is diversity, inclusion, and equity, when most people use that acronym, what they're actually talking about, as you say, is diversity. And diversity is literal variation. So variation um, in the racial background of folks who work at your, your organization. Um, diversity does not equal inclusion and it absolutely does not equal equity. You can have an organization that is predominantly people of color, in fact, and it can be completely rooted in white dominant culture upholding institutional and structural racism. So just because you have folks of color as part of your organization doesn't mean that you have a culture that is inclusive of the lived of experiences of those folks. Um, but so, people, well, there's, so there's not something inherently wrong with saying DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but it sounds like your, your concern is that people stop at the D and yeah. they, don't, they don't move to the E and the I. Yeah, and on, on average, people have no actual understanding of what inclusion is okay. relative to diversity or equity. And they use that acronym um, when what they're really talking about is diversity. But the other thing that they'll do is they'll use DEI and equity interchangeably when they're you know, vastly different things. You, you can't generally have equity or inclusion without variation without diversity um, but one doesn't equal the other um, right, right, right. so diversity is the literal variation folks of different backgrounds very transactional counting people organizations that focus on diversity um, have that work dei work generally based in the hr or talent function and the whole conversation is about recruiting more diverse individuals so partnering with affinity you know colleges or professional associations to pull diverse individuals, people of color into the organization, and that's generally where it stops. There's no thought given to the experience of those people once they become employees. Right. Um, and so inclusion goes past diversity, and that's where you pause to think about the lived experience of people of color inside of the organization and outside of the organization, and sort of acknowledge that the lived experience of people of color is different than that of white people. And the working experience inside of an organization is different for white people and people of color, and start to have an honest conversation about how white dominant culture navigate, uh, mediates that difference in lived experience and in inclusion, you're beginning to transform your, your culture to be inclusive of a multiplicity of identities and ways of being, because our standard setting is white dominant culture. That's the normal way, that's the good way, that's the professional way. Um, and so what you're doing when you're building inclus inclusion in an organization is creating manifold ways of being and doing that are not necessarily or tied to the white dominant standard, uh, but there are many ways that you can be and do and be equally valued in the organization, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah. And then for equity, equity is something that you can measure, which is one reason why I tend to, to not use the word equitable, though it always comes up, you know, in terms of when you're trying to craft sentences, because equity must be measurable. 
in any situation, whether you're in a hospital looking at health outcomes, whether you're inside of a nonprofit looking at compensation, promotion, retention, investment of professional development dollars, if you disaggregate your data by race mm -hmm. and there is no disparity, that is equity. And in society, race is the biggest driver of disparity. So we're extremely, you know, light years away from equ measurable equity in U.S. society. And then when you look at the data inside of organizations, which Building Movement Project did a couple of years ago, uh, the same year we published our paper, and they're refreshing that research this year, there are also significant disparities inside of nonprofit organizations driven by race. So you can't say that you have equity unless you have disaggregated all of your data and found that on the key, these key indicators, so inside of an organization, compensation, retention, promotion, professional investment, professional development dollars, um, staff performance ratings. You've disaggregated those things by race and there is no difference. There's, I'm no more likely to get a two on a scale of one to five as a black person than a white person is. Yeah. That's equity. That's the equity. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you for flushing that. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, that's a deeper understanding of DEI than, uh, than I think than most people have. Um, and they, and it, it hadn't been apparent to me that a lot of people just stop with diversity and don't really understand equity and inclusion. Um, all right, so I, I can understand why you, you don't favor that term, um, but it is common. So it's I wanna, out there, yes. I so I flush it out. We've used it, there. I've used it on the show and I've had guests talk about DEI, mm -hmm. and, all right. Yeah. Um, so and thanks. so when I say race equity, I'm really talking about the E in, in DEI. And so one reason I try to say race equity versus DEI, because my per, my personal approach is tied to race equity. Right. And I am trying to be clear that I'm not talking about DEI, which is usually just diversity. Um, and so being explicit in that way is, is helpful. And we encourage that to support folks in developing an understanding of what the differences are. What do you say to folks who say, well, uh, racial equity, okay, uh, I'm, I'll work toward that and go on that journey, but what about uh, age equity and gender equity? How come we can't focus on those? Well, we actually have been focusing on those. If you look at the data in the for-profit sector and the nonprofit sector, the group of individuals, the subsector of the U.S. population that has made the biggest gains in terms of quote-unquote affirmative action are white women. So gender equity, um, the significant differences in pay, notwithstanding across sectors, when you look mm -hmm. at gender, um, there's been tremendous gains for women in the workforce. In fact, the tremendous gains for women in the workforce correlate with the affirmative action and civil rights activity where organizations were, or society was beginning to become integrated. And laws were enacted with the goal of bringing folks of color, black people specifically at that point in time, into the workforce, but the biggest gains were made by white women. So there's been an explicit focus on gender, and most often the explicit focus on gender um, is cor correlates or comes along with a desire and a discomfort with explicitly focusing on race. So we would fo rather focus on gender. We would rather focus on ageism than focusing on race because saying race and talking about race makes us uncomfortable. uncomfortable yeah. um, so I'd say that first of all, but the real reason to center race in a discussion of equity, which does not mean that you are not considering intersectional identities like gender, ability, age, you know, gender, uh, gender identity. Yeah, these things are um, not mutually exclusive that we- They are not. We can focus They're on race and, that, and to the exclusion of other categories, the age, you know, I mentioned age and gender, but yeah, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so when race equity is done well, you are explicitly acknowledging and integrating work on all of those identities into the process, but you're centering race. And the reason you center race is number one, because race is the biggest driver of disparities in our society. Um, okay. This is a very common question. Just Google it. Race is the biggest driver of disparities in rates of mortality and educa health, education, criminal justice, housing, across the board. That's why we center race. The other reason we center race is because if you don't explicitly center race, it falls off the table because people would rather talk about gender. They're more comfortable with gender. They don't want to actually say the word race because we as Americans are socialized not to talk about race. Yeah. So those are really the two key reasons. Okay, that's a fantastic segue to your research because 
that uh, th that report, Awake to Woke to Work, is going to help our listeners um, start this conversation about race and racism and white power structures and white privilege in their organizations. So that's that's why I wanted us to uh, to talk because uh, that's what I want to help listeners do. Those who want to start this long journey, um, I would like to help them get started. So tell us about the uh, the research. I mean, I, I know it's it's long, and we, you could you could do a couple hour workshop on the research. But I can do a quick I can do a quick snapshot. Uh, give us the executive summary, yeah, for for the sure. that report uh, awake to woke to work. Sure, but that is it is a really great segue because the genesis of the report was a desire to create a resource that could help people do exactly what you said. So for years, there have been ton of, tons of articles on, like we were saying, DEI um, and what to do and, and how to dismantle even explicitly white dominant culture in, in the workplace. But what we didn't see as a team was a resource that made the case for the need for a race equity culture and then presented a framework and some key steps and best practices yeah. that allow people to pivot from awareness to action. Because where organizations will spend years is in the gap between awareness and action. So we know this is an issue. We probably have been doing some things on diversity, trying to hire people of color. Um, we understand there's some broader system at play perhaps, but we're not even sure how, what it is that we're supposed to do to move forward. And so that was the literal genesis of the paper. So it outlines a framework for how organizations move from awake to woke to work, which is how we reframed diversity, inclusion, and equity, um, and outlines characteristics um, of organizations at each stage by lever. So when we did the research, we found that there were seven management and operational levers, which were essentially clusters of best practices around functional areas that organizations had used to measurably shift their culture um, toward equity. So the paper outlines the framework. It gives you a profile of what organizations generally look like at awake, woke, and work. And then there are these detailed matrices with, with best practices and action steps that organizations can adopt to begin to move from awake to woke to work. And we found that organizations on average stayed in a, a stage of the race equity cycle for three to five years, but were often there for up to 10. Um, the overwhelming majority of organizations are at the awake stage, or as some people will joke, pre-awake. Pre like not even really thinking about any of these things. Mm -hmm. um, the woke, which is the second stage, but the process is not linear. So we're always really clear not to say this is, this is not a checklist or like a playbook to, of things to do in sequence because this work is not linear. Um, woke is generally the longest period because that's inclusion. That's where an organization is transforming its culture to center equity. So at the awake stage, like we were talking about with diversity and DEI, it's transactional. You're focused on representation. There isn't consideration given to the different lived experiences of people of color. And there is a combination of explicit and implicit assimilation. So if you get a job as a person of color and you're brought into the organization, the assumption often stated, but sometimes not stated explicitly through coded language, like whether or not a person is a fit, you're expected to assimilate to white dominant culture and show up and be and do and interact in the standard sort of status quo way that the organization has set forth, which broadly always aligns to society. Um, and that's sort of where you are. It's transactional um, at the awake stage. And then at the woke stage, that's when organizations have acknowledged, like I was saying earlier, that there are different experiences um, for live, lived experiences for people of color inside and outside the organization. And that's when they are beginning to transform their culture to center equity. So what you would see when an organization is beginning to do that is things like affinity groups or in the for-profit space, they're, they're sometimes called employee resource groups. So affinity groups for folks of color and for white people to talk about the experience, their experience of race inside of the organization and in society broadly and how that experience intersects with the organization's ability to do, do its work, which in the social sector is partic of particular importance because overwhelmingly we are doing work in support of communities at the margins, like communities that are affected by inequities, and those are disproportionately black and brown people. So starting to bring together this explicit 
focus on black and brown communities in the language we use and beginning to build a culture where talking about the lived experiences of uh, black and brown folks and the experience of, of white folks and how they interplay with one another then also becomes explicit inside of the organization um, as well as in its work with folks outside of the organization like with their partners or the communities that they serve um, the work stage is the way we framed equity and at that stage that's where i like to say an organization's mission statement around uh dei or their public statements on things like unfortunately the the murder of george floyd the language that they use in those statements actually correlates with the culture that the organization lives on a daily basis so organizations at all stages of the race equity cycle release statements not just on the death of george floyd though there's been a real clear shift in the explicit um, naming of Black Lives Matter and the value of Black life. Um, but people have been releasing statements for years. But what does not generally correlate is the experience of people of color inside of organizations making those statements with the content of the statement itself. So at the work stage, you will have been focused on race equity and transforming your culture for years, generally at least 10. Um, and those two things would be aligned. Um, and so that's one one characteristic we use to talk about what it looks like at the at the at the work stage. And so an organization would be have shifted its culture internally and then also play a role externally in their community and in society as an advocate for equity, like encouraging other organizations to do the work that they have done and calling attention to structural oppression and racism and naming how it shows up. So I'm going to urge listeners who do want to embark on this to, to just, you got to read the report. Uh, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's many pages, but it's excellent. And it does have a lot of things. And, you know, I uh, thank you for saying that it's not a checklist because I was sort of thinking of it as that you don't, you don't say that, you know, do this item first and this item second, but um, I was sort of thing, seeing it as linear and you, yeah, I, it's I, not, I'm still, yeah. I'm still working through this and talking through these things, but uh, you're not the first guest to say that, you know, this journey is not linear. There aren't steps you check off and then you move to the next stage. You know, it's not, it's not like that. So thank mm -hmm. you. And that's how organizational change is. You know, if you've, if you've done organizational development work or change yeah. management, it's not linear. And in terms of the human response to change and difficult conversations, it's not our response as humans is not always logical. Like we resist, we resist change. And so all of that is bound up in change work period, but in race equity work, especially because you're trying to unwind centuries of socialization. And that is not something that a checklist is gonna help you work through. Yeah. Um, it just takes really hard and deep work and it requires an organization to do more than training. So an organization has to create learning opportunities for folks to learn about structural oppression and racism, to learn about white privilege and how it shows up, um, to learn about privilege period, because privilege exists across manifold identities, like you were saying around intersectionality. So to begin to name those things and then to support individuals in scaffolding their work processes as their internal growth on these issues and learning develops. So, you know, it takes us a while to increase our capacity in any skill. And so what organizations have to do is have a parallel process where they're helping their staff, exposing their staff to learning opportunities that will increase their capacity on equity. But they also have to put in place some policies and procedures that help to scaffold work and thinking as we grow and one tool for doing that is something called a race equity impact assessment and it's a set of questions that team members can use at key at, at key inflection points in their work so when they're making a decision so like hiring you know identifying a vendor entering into a partnership it's a set of questions that people think through to consider the potential disparate impact of the decision they're making by race mm -hmm. and so that's a good reflection of like the work organizations have to do in parallel Okay. Um, let's tell listeners at least for the first time, uh, and if uh, I'll try to remember to do it at the end, or you can remind me, where do where do they find uh, the report? Oh, sure. So it's on our website, 
uh, equityinthecenter.org. If you go to the website and go to the resources page, it's the first thing um, at the top of that page. You can also Google Awake to Woke to Work and it'll come up um, in Google, but it lives on our website. So okay, cool. uh, we'd encourage you to, to go there. On the resources page, there's the publication. And then if you scroll down a bit, there's also an article that I wrote for Bridge Fan, which is a summary of research insights for senior leaders. Um, and I recommend that piece to folks uh, sort of as a first step and also as something that you can share with board members or leadership, um, something that's not overwhelming in terms of its length because the paper because, is 20 ish pages. Yeah. Right. Right. And because senior leadership is critical to this. Yeah. And we try to be as honest in that article as we are in the paper about what it is that we're talking about, yeah. which is structural right. racism and privilege. So let's, um, let's spend some time talking about what, what what we need to do, you know, intern in our own office. So, if if I'm a CEO and and okay, so let's hypothet let's say I am the CEO because uh, it becomes even tougher if mm -hmm. I'm not the CEO. Well, let's make it let's make it tougher. So I'm not the CEO. I'm well intentioned in my organization and I want to elevate this conversation to to the CEO mm -hmm. uh, so that we can get that senior leadership. Uh, buy-in which is which is going to be essential to this long journey's work um which i do I, all right so the, the bridge span article that's value that is valuable because it because it outlines how important senior leadership is and some sort of initial steps um to the you know leading as you said you know summarizing the the, the full research the full report um but i want you to say it instead of me <laughs> Sure. So that would be what do I do? If I always what recommend the hell, what the hell can I do to, to elevate this conversation to get it started at, uh, in my office? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, we get it a lot. Um, and so I do, I recommend sending the Bridge Fan article. If you're, you know, a senior leader or a, a manager who's trying to quote, make the case, that's the language that's often used. Okay. Um, make okay. the case for this work is to send the Bridge Fan article. It's quick and clear. Um, the other thing that you can do, though, now that we're in the midst of this civil rights crisis um, because of the murder of George Floyd, there's actually less of a need to make the case because something is happening and everyone may not understand exactly what, what it is. But I think that what's happening in the world makes the case. So I would say most organizations now see that they have to do something. Um, but what, you know, to your point, so I would say share the, share the Birdspan article also share the paper. So it's like, here's something you can read relatively quickly, the article, here's the full paper. Um, and both the article and the paper make recommendations on other resources folks can use. So one of the best places to start, though honestly it's not usually where organizations start, um, is with a training on structural racism. So Racial Equity Institute, Race Forward, People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, Crossroads, um, these are all organizations that do excellent trainings on structural racism and they illustrate um, centuries of oppression and then pull the thread to like how they're relevant to the way we operate in society today. Um, where organizations generally start diversity or equity training, once they've gotten beyond sort of the just focusing on hiring, they'll start with implicit bias training. Implicit bias training is not recommended as a place to start. And the reason is that implicit bias training doesn't work. You can Google it. They're actually many articles on why it doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work in terms of driving progress on equity is because implicit bias training raises awareness of your own bias. What it generally does not do well is give people a clear set of action steps that they can take to mitigate their implicit bias. And what organizations then fail to do is scaffold their learning inside of the organization um, by helping to revise policies and procedures to mitigate bias because bias is an indicator or a symptom of structural racism and institutional racism. It's not the thing itself. So my recommendation would be like a Racial Equity Institute's groundwater training, which is a half day training generally for CEOs and board members who don't have the time or necessarily the interest in learning about racism for two and a half days, which is their standard training 
just like PISABs, People's Institutes training is also two and a half days, as is Crossroads. So I would recommend that, it's like share the paper, share the article, share the paper, um, share some resources on structural racism. And there are those trainings, many of which are now given virtually. In the past two weeks, um, there have been, I don't know, hundreds of lists that I've seen circulated, many of which have really rich resources on the history of structural oppression. And so I think that's a good place to start um, in making the case for change. Okay, I'm not clear on something mm -hmm. uh, uh, around implicit bias training. Is your point that that's not the right place to start? No, that, that is where not, most people valuable. Start. It's just not valuable at any at any stage. I would not say it's not valuable at any stage oh, it's because not, the, not the right the, place to start. It's not the right place to start, okay, in my opinion, but it no. is where most organizations have started. Okay. Um, but because it has the shortcomings that you described. It's, it sounds like it, it's stopping on the personal level. Exactly. It, it, it's focusing on the personal level, but it's not going to the interpersonal, the institutional, mm -hmm. and the structural. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And people need. Um, the thread to be pulled because we're humans and particularly in the workplace, we're adults. So all of this work has to be done, taking into account principles of adult learning and the runway one needs to shift from awareness to application, to assimilation and application of a skill. And in general, implicit bias training doesn't do that. Okay. It just communicates, okay. you've got bias, here are some examples. So if, for example, you hired a race equity consultant who was gonna come in and help your organization navigate this work, they would talk about implicit bias. But the important difference um, with what a race equity practitioner would do and what just a standard implicit bias training would provide is pull the thread from structural racism to how implicit bias shows up in our personal and professional lives. And exactly as you said, being very intentional about the personal, interpersonal, institutional, and structural levels at which racism operates. And that clarity is not part of the standard training on implicit bias, unless you have someone who is also very well versed in organizational transformation and equity, because intellectually, like cognitively, that's what we need to understand. It's not just about the choices that I make as an individual, it's about the choices we make collectively as an institution. And it's all related, but as you develop a you know, plan to shift your culture to center equity, what a consultant will do, or like your learning partner would do, is to craft an agenda, a learning agenda, that had some really explicit goals and resources that target each of those four levels. Because what an organization has to do is work concurrently at all four of those levels to help make progress as the organization moves forward. And that's, those four levels and that orientation to the work is generally, it's almost always lacking in quote unquote implicit bias training. Yeah, okay, yeah, I understand. All right, um, you've, uh, you've talked several times about, uh, about having a, a professional uh, facilitator, trainer. Uh, so there's, there's obviously gonna be a lot of value in that. This is something that um, through, the, through time has to be intentionally made part of, uh, part of budgeting, um, you know, part of institutional priorities, right? I mean, th th that's sort of where you get the, where you need mm -hmm. that, that leadership buy-in when we're talking about money and prioritization. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the paper talks about, and it's, this is mentioned in the Bridge Band article today, there's a, a snapshot of like the cost. It is expensive. And we are in the season of COVID. Um, as well as sort of the civil rights crisis. So, you know, I don't want to understate the importance of resources and how constrained some folks are at this, this moment in time. Um, but generally, the lack of resources and the expense of this work is something that people use as an excuse to not do it. Yeah, right. and, we can't have, yeah. Yeah, and so what we've talked about, um, I think with my colleagues, in the past month or so, like going back to when you know COVID was the only national crisis, is the fact that COVID illustrates the need for sustained equity work because COVID is a disease, but the way it has unfolded in our society, yeah. just like everything else, right. is along lines of social inequity. You know, the highest per capita rate of infection is among the Navajo Nation. People of color, Black and Latinx people particularly, are dying at, you know, in some cities, 10 times the rate of their white fellow residents. Um, so 
COVID is an equity crisis. And if an organization had cultivated a race equity lens prior to COVID, um, they would be in a better position to have a race explicit response to COVID. Because what questions we got, and the link to this webinar, which I did with um, independent sector, as well as one that we did with uh, grant makers for effective organizations prior to George Floyd's death, talks about this. So people see the numbers of disproportionate uh, rates of death and infection. And so their question is, how do I apply a race equity lens to my COVID response? Um, and the real to do is to apply a race equity lens in your work period. So what some people are doing is using COVID as a case study for why their organization should have always had a race equity lens. And George Floyd is a tragic, just like COVID is also a tragic illustration of how inequity unfolds in society. So some folks have been building their equity muscle around COVID and then George Floyd was murdered. Um, so it's the same racism. So there are lots of situational things like COVID, um, other things always will always emerge in society, but because of how our how society is structured, um, inequity will always manifest. Yeah, it's, it's you know it's, it's the difference between making this uh, transactional versus institutional and structural. You know, your your organization can react to the latest murder uh, epidemic, you know, or whatever whatever the next episode becomes. Uh, you know, and, and that's on the on a transactional basis, or you can have these the these this thinking and, and this orientation at the institutional and structural level, so that your reaction just isn't isn't based on the incident. It's because of the incident, but it's not devoted to the incident. You, you've got the you've got the perspective broadly, and of course you react to the to the latest episode, but. It's, it's not on a tran done on a transaction. Yeah, it's not a one off because yeah, you one understand one right, right. that right. it is, it's the same. And this is what I say to a lot. I'm like, it's the same racism. Yeah. So yeah. manifesting through COVID, uh, you know, manifesting through the disproportionate rate of murder of uh, Black men and Black people by the police, it's the same racism that we've had since this country was, was founded. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so yeah. if you're bringing a race equity analysis to all of your work, you can explicitly name that and make the connections to whatever the current crisis is, like COVID, for example. Um, one thing that will come about as part of doing this work, and this is uh, knowledge that folks would gain when they do one of the trainings that I mentioned, like with Race Forward or PISAB or REI or Crossroads, um, which is the hierarchy of human value. So this does tie somewhat to like implicit bias, um, but how bias is woven into the structure of society and into our institutions. But what folks have to reckon with, in addition to just structural racism, is that racism is rooted in the pyramid of human value. And that places black people at the bottom and, and white people at the top. Mm -hmm. And then other people of color are stacked in order of their proximity to whiteness and the color of their skin in between. And as you learn why implicit bias is so insidious in its origins, it's the hierarchy of human value. And so part of this work is reckoning with that and naming how not just Black people, but people of color are treated as less valuable humans inside of organizations every day. We are treated as less valuable humans in society. That's part of our daily, just daily life. Um, but what the, the connection that you're making at those four levels you talked about is how this hierarchy of human value manifests in your personal beliefs, in your interactions with other people, that's where microaggressions and like overt racism in terms of words and deed uh, show up. Institutional, how the hierarchy of human value is reflected in your institutional policy and practice. So you can look at you know, whether or not people um, have a college degree, whether or not they went to a good school, whether or not they speak the King's English, and then structural, which is how all of those things inside of an organization work together and how all of these things play together in broader, broader society. Um, it's not just that communities have not um, gotten to the point where they're graduating from high school or going to college or you know, have enough savings or generational wealth because they're lazy and uneducated. Like there is a real reason in terms of policy um, which is rooted in the, the, the pyramid of human value, because all of these people were not considered equally worthy of opportunity in society. 
Um, and so with the training that you can do with these organizations, it pull, it tells that story. And then what the, it will do is provide case examples over the course of American history um, that illustrate how this has played out. Okay, let's, um, let's spend our last couple minutes uh, talking about what, what the value is going to be. Um, I don't want to say on the other end, because this is, it's a journey, it's long, I, I'm not sure the work ever really ends. Um, so I don't want to say on the other end, but what, what, a, what an organization that, that truly you know, fosters um, equity and inclusion what that looks like, what, what, what's, the, what's the advantage to, our, to our, our employees, to our organization, to the people we're serving, and then you know, to the culture, that mm -hmm. we'll be contributing to the culture when we, we do, do, yeah. do this work seriously. When you build a race equity culture. Yeah, I think but in an organization by the time, and again, like we were saying, this takes years, if an organization builds a race equity culture, if it centers equity and completely transforms its culture to center equity, from a measurable, measurable standpoint, once you get to that point, you will have closed race-based disparities inside of your organization. In terms of the value um, to people, um, people of color, so people who are not white would feel equally valued as humans, first of all because I think what a lot of people don't understand is that we do not feel equally valued as humans inside of organizations. In society, again, part of our everyday life, but in on your job, also part of everyday life. So that would be the key benefit for people of color um, is that we would be treated as equally valuable human beings. And what people don't understand is that in policy and practice, in word and deed inside of organizations, it is overwhelmingly communicated that we are not the way we speak, the way we show up, the way our communities um, live, is all of these things, both explicitly and implicitly, are named and treated as less valuable. So I would say that that is the main, the, the, the main benefit, is that we are treated as equally valuable humans. Um, in terms of what the organization would look like in having a race equity culture, um, if you look at the woke, um, column of the matrices in the paper, there are lots of indicators of, of or, or characteristics of what the organization would look like, but essentially it would have multiple manifold ways of being and doing, multiple identities would be valued and central to the culture of the organization so that there isn't just one way of being and doing that is tied to the white dominant standard but there are many ways like going back to what we talked about before that you can be and do and be valued equally inside of an organization a great article for people to look at is tama oaken's characteristics of white supremacy culture and it outlines those characteristics and examples of them inside of a nonprofit organization isn't that, um, is that one of the articles that's indexed in the in the research it is. Yeah, yes, I, I, I recognize. I don't know that piece, but I, I recognize her name when you said it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's easily okay. You win. It's phonetic, so easily Googleable, and it's a great discussion starter. Like, look at the characteristics and find yourself in them, because whether you're white or a person of color, you will find yourself because our society's st like standard operating procedure is those characteristics. So, at the end of this process, you would have created a culture that has a completely different set of characteristics that define it and that reflect a multiplicity of people. Sometimes people will look at that list and one of the characteristics is worship of the written word. And so they're like, so what are we not supposed to email anymore or write things? Like, obviously not. Right. But the point is that you would be valued as a professional, regardless of whether you are able to articulate your key point in five to seven bullet, bullet points. That there is more than one way of being that is valued. Um, but I'd say the, going back to what I said initially, first of all, you would be able to demonstrate that you have closed race-based disparities inside of your organization if you have built a race equity culture. People of color would be equally valued. White people would be aware of white supremacy and white dominant culture, their role in it. People of color would also be aware of their role in up upholding it. And everyone would actively on a daily basis have to make the choice to do the opposite of that in the practice of their work together and the policies and process of the organization as defined like formally in what's written down and how they work together would be actively anti-racist and 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 for the culture generally 
for the for the for our for our country. You know, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'm 58 and still naive, but you know, there can uh, imagine imagine the country in a state where you know race is uh, racism is has been called out and and race is is just not not the issue. Like we don't fear saying the word race and racism. The words you know in our office any longer. I mean, just just that would would be would be a yeah. quite an and achievement. But you know, would, we got to go way beyond just being able to just uh, comfort with a couple of words. But you know, it, again, uh, maybe I'm naive, but but I, you know, a country where race is just a, a state of of being, and everybody everybody acknowledges it and isn't uncomfortable with it, and we're all included and 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 equally so yeah and the, the color of your skin doesn't define the course of your of your life it doesn't define I mean, whether or not you'll survive yeah. childbirth yeah. um so that that in broader society there all of those race-based disparities in health and education and housing etc those would have been closed and i would be equally likely to graduate from college survive childbearing um survive being pulled over by a cop um if if we got there as a as a society we are very far from that and i think the mm -hmm. the, the vision is very helpful in help pushing us all forward but one thing that i always note and my colleagues will also note is that we as a people do not know how to have a society that centers equity so i do have partner organizations who've been working on this in their organization for decades and have built a race equity culture so inside of their organizations people name race name their privilege um lead with their complicity and upholding a system actively you know take actions that are anti-racist inside of the organization and outside of the organization yeah. um and it's good to have that vision in our head but we are learning something that we don't know how to do none of us has actually lived in that society because this country was not founded to be that society so we have to you know people always say make it up as you as you as you go along i think we're in the process and what we see on the streets of america and around the world is people pushing for that becoming so to speak um, but we have to create it together by making different choices. And I, I don't think we know exactly what is going to happen when everyone starts doing some of the things that you described because we haven't yet seen it. Keep the vision, but don't be a Pollyanna either. Yeah, and we'll know we're there when there are no race-based disparities. Um, yeah. And you know, we, we all are equally valued as humans in this, in this society. But what it takes to get from here to there I think the, like our paper, for example, shows some characteristics of what organizations would look like. There's lots of writing on um, like what society would look like in terms of anti-racism, the redistribution of, like even if you look at the examples of community alternatives to the police that have been put out into the public uh, square, so to speak, for the past week, that's an example of how a structure in society could look different. Um, and I think we have to craft those together going forward because in many, instances what it would take to yield that vision is the opposite of how this country operates okay dose of reality as well um and and on the on the hopeful side uh just yesterday so sunday uh june what's today june june 8th so on sunday mm -hmm. june 7th um the minneapolis City Council voted to yeah, dismantle uh, in a veto-proof majority. So the the mayor, who was opposed, yeah. to it, cannot uh, cannot uh, override it. Uh, d dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department, and that's mm -hmm. that in itself is a long process. Yeah. And to your point that you just you just mentioned, no one knows today what that will look like. What the Minneapolis, I'll just call it public safety and security, because it may not even be called a police department. What it what what public safety will look like in Minneapolis two years from now, yeah. but but they're committed to change. Yeah, and they can and they're look committed at Camden. To, they're they dismantling Camden, New Jersey. what exists now, and they're going to replace it with something, presumably, better and safer yeah. for everybody. Hopefully, hopefully yes. And there are a couple of instances like Camden, New Jersey, which they didn't dismantle their uh, the police department, they transformed it. So there are some examples in the US and around the world of different models that we could use. Um, mm -hmm. 
And that is a hopeful um, indicator. I think what's happening in America is a hopeful indicator. If white people see the value to them, because this is the case that people of color are constantly having to make. Why does this matter? Like, how is this valuable to me? I'm fine. You know, I feel like I don't see color. Um, the, the, the playing field is level. So if there is a significant shift and there appears to be a shift happening in white people acknowledging that those things are not true, um, that they have significant privilege and that their own privilege has to be dismantled to value all humans equally, millions of white people pushing for that will yield change. Because what we've been doing up to this point is mostly people of color, and in this country, black people, have been pushing for civil rights. Not that there have not been white allies who have been helpful at, sure. at key points. Yeah. Um, because in a system of white supremacy, progress without the support of white allies is good, at key happen. points is not actually possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the people that the system preferences have to want to dismantle it. And I think when that reaches critical mass and we seem to be trending into something different, then I think there is a much, there's a likelihood, who knows how long it will take, that that vision can come to pass. Um, but black, white people have to want to dismantle white, the system yeah. that preferences them. And they have the power to make that happen by centering the experiences and working in partnership with people of color. Because I'm not saying that white people should then lead the, you know, lead the charge, so to speak. You would need to do those, dismantle white supremacy um, by centering the lived experiences of people of color and communities of color in that process. But those who benefit from the system have to want to get rid of it. And we're trending there, like you said. We're, we, yeah. we haven't reached a tipping point, but there are, there's a lot of indicators. Yeah, and racism is killing us all. So by, by being in a society where some people are not valued as e equally human, it dehumanizes the people who the, the society believes or values as fully human. White people are dehumanized by racism. And I think people are starting to talk about that. So yes, we die, like we get killed as black people and people of color in very different ways. George Floyd being a tragic example of that, but it has also killed and is killing white people because it's dehumanizing them in a different way than it does black people and people of color. Um, but it is killing us all just the same. Kay Suarez, she's uh, executive director of Equity in the Center. You'll find their report, Awake to Woke to Work, at equityinthecenter.org and in the resources. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Go to the resources, resources. Uh, okay. page. Yeah. Okay. And they are also at equity in the CTR. K is at KLRS98. K, thank you very much. Thanks for sharing. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and yeah, let me know if I can be helpful. Well, we may have you back. So you, uh, you already are helpful. Uh, you could be even more helpful. I mean, Thanks. I'm not saying you held back. That doesn't sound right. You held back. You could have, <laughs> I thought, you could have been I a much more helpful. What? No, that's I not, that's not what we meant. Yes, that's not what I meant. Yes, I'd love to have you back. Uh, you can be even even more valuable and helpful uh, by, by, by coming back again. Thank you. Thank you for awesome. what you're doing. And, and thanks for spending time uh, with me talking about this. Our creative producer is Claire Meyerhoff. The show's social media is by Susan Chavez. Mark Silverman is our web guy. And this music that you're hearing is by Scott Stein. Many thanks to Susan and Mark for helping me get this special episode out to you very quickly. Be with me next time, which will be later this week, on Nonprofit Radio, big nonprofit ideas for the other 95%. Go out and be great. <laughs> <laughs>